Number three, man proposes, God disposes. Can a painting cause someone to die by suicide? That's the story behind the chilling portrait, man proposes, God disposes. On May 19, 1845, Captains John Franklin and James Fitzjames set sail on their two ships, the Erebus and the Terror. Departing from Kent, England, their destination was the unnavigated Canadian Arctic, where they hoped to find the Northwest Passage. The two men and their 129 crew members were never heard from again. Three years later, Franklin's wife, Lady Jane, pressured the British government to at least try to find her husband. Several search parties turned up nothing, until nine years later when Captain John Ray reported back that the remnants of the crew and their ships had been found amongst the local Inuit tribes of the Arctic. Ray also reported that what few human bones they did find showed signs of cannibalism. The story rocked Great Britain at the time. People were outraged. The infamed writer Charles Dickens weighed in, saying Ray's conclusions were impossible. There was no way, they said, that proper Englishmen would ever resort to such savagery. Whether true or not, the news of the discovery fired the imagination of Britons. And none more than noted artist Edward Landseer, who, in 1864, felt compelled to paint Man Proposes, God Disposes. Measuring 3 feet by 8 feet, Landseer's painting depicts the last remains of the Franklin Expedition as is pawed over by two fierce polar bears. Clearly, Landseer was trying to offer an explanation for the preposterous supports of cannibalism. But what he painted instead was almost more disturbing. One of the bears crouches over a human ribcage, a broken rib bone clenched in its jaws. The other polar bear in the painting rips at a blood red ensign flag, and both beasts look ferocious and hungry. When Landseer debuted his painting a year later in London, he had no idea that John Franklin's wife, Lady Jane, would be in attendance. She called the painting outrageous and even questioned the artist's sanity. Landseer would die shortly thereafter due to a long illness. Some newspapers recounted that on the weeks before his death he had become mentally incapacitated, possibly due to his chronic alcoholism. A few years later, Thomas Holloway, obsessed with the fate of the Franklin Expedition, shelled out £6,000 for the painting. That's roughly US dollars today, an astronomical amount at the time. Holloway hung Man Proposes, God Disposes, a large picture gallery at a new women's university he had founded. And there it remained on display for the next 65 years, without incident, until the 1950s, when the students at Holloway College, it seemed, were cheating on their exams. It was hard to blame them. After all, their exam hall featured stadium-style seating and connected desks making it almost impossible for them not to see the answers on the test next to them. So it was decided that exams would be moved into the Holloway College Picture Gallery, right next to Edwin Lancier's most famous and most disturbing work. Almost immediately, students started feeling uneasy with the painting overlooking their test-taking. Complaints ranged from students being distracted by the polar bears to being downright nauseated. Canvas rumors swirled that one student, while sitting for exams, stared too long at the painting, as if captured by the gaze of one of the polar bears. They supposedly left the gallery and died by suicide. They left their test behind, which read, The polar bear made me do it. Throughout the 60s, the rumor picked up steam, with its details changing enough to classify it as an urban legend. The sex of the student in the story became male or female, depending on the teller. The method of suicide also varied from hanging to jumping off the school's carved arch. There is no evidence that this suicide ever happened, but then there is no evidence that it didn't happen. 
whether the painting is haunted, cursed, or just plain bad luck, in the 1970s, one student flat out refused to sit anywhere near it. According to the school's curator, the exam proctor at the time panicked over the student's refusal, grabbed the biggest thing they could find to cover up the painting. They draped a massive Union Jack flag over the frame, appeasing not only the student, but perhaps the demons in the painting itself. Because the flag was placed backwards, so as if to form a protective shield. Ever since then, at every exam period at Royal Holloway College, the same Union Jack flag covers, man proposes, God disposes. Lest the hungry polar bears gaze upon another victim. Number 2. The Portrait of Henry Ann Nelson Miss Nelson was a spinster. In terms of the late 1700s, a spinster was considered an unmarried woman of advancing age. Being unmarried also gave Miss Nelson no means to support herself. It was good then that she found her cousin, Francis Leakey, in 1778. They had not grown up together, but met later in life through family connections. Henrietta and Francis, despite their age difference, got along well. When Francis's brother, Seymour, fell ill at their family manor called Yaxley Hall in Suffolk, England, they both packed their bags and moved to be with him at the country estate. They were there to help tend to his affairs. Suspiciously, soon after their arrival in 1786, Seymour changed his will on his deathbed. He gave over his entire estate and grounds to Francis and Henrietta for however long they both lived. Seymour died a few days after changing his will. Henrietta and Francis, she being 52 and he being 35, lived at Yaxley Hall for the next 30 years together. They hosted dinner parties and dances and made a fortune farming the 400 acres surrounding the manor. So well off were they that Francis commissioned local painter William Johnson to paint their portraits in 1795. Francis chose to be painted in a massive 8-foot canvas dressed in full regalia accompanied by his dog, Sherry. But for Henrietta, he chose a modest 17 by 14 inch portrait. Seated in an expensive Chippendale chair, Miss Nelson sports a tight expression with just a hint of a smug grin. Wearing a massive bonnet above her graying hair and holding two pink roses, the 61 year old Miss Nelson looks almost pleased with herself, like she's pulled one over on someone. The next 20 years pass uneventfully. While not entertaining neighbors, Miss Nelson bided her time strolling the grounds of Yaxley Hall, pruning flowers. But she always steered clear of consecrated soil around nearby Yaxley Church. The church grounds held the family mausoleum, and inside the mausoleum vault was buried former Yaxley governess, Madame Seymour. The reasons for Henrietta's superstition are lost to history. Madame Seymour died when Henrietta was only six years old. But perhaps she had every reason to be spooked. You see, Madame Seymour was very protective of Yaxley Manor, and she did not like interlopers. So perhaps it was no surprise when, in February 1816, Henrietta Nelson suffered an unfortunate accident. When ascending a short set of stairs from her bedroom to the oak panel chapel gallery where her portrait had hung for two decades, Miss Nelson fell. Servants rushed to carry the 82-year-old woman back to her bedroom. Bedridden and unable to move for seven weeks, her bed sores became infected. And she died at 9.26 p.m. on April 4, 1816. In her last will and testament, Henrietta gave everything she owned to her companion and cousin, Francis. But her will also highlighted one strange stipulation. She refused to be buried in the family mausoleum alongside Madame Seymour. As per her wishes, Francis built Miss Nelson her very own mausoleum on the grounds of the great manor 
at great personal expense. And it was there that Miss Henrietta Nelson lay in repose for the next 40 years. Life went on at Yaxley Hall, with her portrait hung in the mansion's gallery. Two years after Miss Nelson's unfortunate demise, Francis married. His wife gave birth to a daughter, whom he named Henrietta. It was in 1840 that young Henrietta married Patrick Welch. And it was Patrick Welch who took over Yaxley Hall. And he destroyed Miss Nelson's final resting place. He bulldozed her personal crypt. He moved her body into the family vault next to Madame Seymour. And that's when the hauntings began. Later, residents of Yaxley Hall began seeing a ghostly apparition wandering the grounds. Wearing the same white bonnet and blue dress Miss Nelson was wearing in her portrait. The pale, ghostly figure would float through the garden as if admiring the flowers. When Miss Nelson's portrait was eventually sold in 1884, it seems her spirit went along with it. Edmund Farrer, who kept Miss Nelson's portrait on his own wall, wrote in 1905 that the picture had a disturbing effect on the minds of his friends. Gazing at the portrait caused them to feel uneasy, he wrote. A century later, Brian Hall of Norfolk, the owner of the painting in 2004, told an appraiser that her face was very much alive. Sometimes her expression would hold that secret grin, or sometimes it appeared mournful, sad, as if she were missing something that was dear to her. Still, the ghost of Henrietta Nelson did not appear to be a malevolent poltergeist. Her spirit just wandered the grounds of whatever place her portrait hung, searching, it seemed. After Mr. Hall passed away, his art collection was sold at auction by Bonhams of the UK. The portrait of Henrietta Nelson sold for just over 3000 US dollars. The new owner saw fit to return it to Yaxley Hall. Since then, the ghost of Henrietta Nelson has not been reported. Having her portrait back in the manor seemed to have tamed her restless spirit and allow her to finally rest in peace. Number 1. Pogo the Clown Self-Portrait Chlorophobia is a condition marked by a person's crippling fear of clowns. In the case of Pogo the Clown, Perhaps that fear was warranted. Pogo was the alter ego of notorious serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who killed upwards of 35 young men in the Chicago, Illinois area in the 1970s. When Gacy was arrested in 1978, authorities found the bodies of most of his victims buried in his basement and backyard. His confession, which he later recanted, cemented his guilty verdict and he was sentenced to death. But while awaiting his execution and seemingly endless appeals, Casey took up jailhouse painting as a hobby. And during the 1980s, he painted upwards of a thousand portraits of everyone, from Elvis Presley to Jesus, from Adolf Hitler to Charles Manson. After her work was completed, Casey would give the portrait to his lawyer for safekeeping because, by law, he couldn't sell them. In 1977, another notorious 70s serial killer, David Berkowitz, tried to sell the rights to his life story to the highest bidder. Lawmakers, worried about killers reaping financial rewards for their crimes, wrote a law preventing just that. But the U.S. Supreme Court struck the Son of Sam law down in 1991. And suddenly, it was open market for Gacy and his crude paintings. Gacy's lawyer began to privately sell some of the paintings, while others found their way into galleries and auctions. Gacy insisted that the money he made would go to his own children, who were understandably mired in a lifetime of psychotherapy bills. In truth, however, the money Gacy made went to his legal fees as he drew out the appeals process to prevent his scheduled 1994 lethal injection. For their part, the families of Gacy's victims were outraged. 
and in 1994 they held a public burning of the killer's paintings. Unfortunately, this publicity only served to increase the cachet of the artwork and more than a few famous faces set about trying to pick up a Gacy or two. Movie star Johnny Depp was a Gacy collector, as was film director John Waters, a rock star and TV host Dave Navarro. With such celebrity clientele, demand for Gacy's paintings skyrocketed in the early 1990s. Particularly, one painting drew the most attention. Entitled Pogo the Clown, the self-portrait depicts Gacy as Pogo, a party clown costume Gacy wore while entertaining children at political events. Versions of the portrait at the time fetched upwards of $1,000. As one collector said, how often do you know when the artist is going to die? Prices only went up after Gacy was executed on May 11, 1994. But before his death, Gacy painted dozens of variations of his self-portrait, Pogo, with each variation identifiable by the color of the balloons the clown holds. It's one variation of this image, one with gold and white balloons, that serves as the haunted painting in question. In 2001, another rock musician, Niggy Stone of Massachusetts, shelled out $3,000 for a genuine sign Pogo the Clown. Immediately, he said things started to go wrong, not only to his own life, but to the lives of those around him. It began, Stone recalled, when his dog died shortly after he brought the portrait home. Soon after, his mother was diagnosed with cancer. Believing the painting was bad luck, Stone gave it to a close friend, who showed it off to his neighbors. A few days later, one of those neighbors was killed in a car accident. The painting changed hands to another of Stone's friends, who attempted suicide while it was in his possession. Eventually, the painting found its way to a local tattoo shop, but the shop's owner, Sean McCarran, refuses to display it. People do ask to see it, he said in 2005. They get a chill through their body. And he says, those of you Pogo the Clown beg him to put it back in the box. Skeptics often look to this story as a hoax. They think of it as a man looking to get back money he spent on a weird piece of art. Why, they ask, out of the hundreds of paintings Gacy made, is only one of them supposedly haunted? The answer may lie in the killer's prison ingenuity. After his artwork gained the attention of celebrities, Gacy found himself with more orders they could handle. Not wanting to turn down a buck, he got creative. He reportedly set up some of his fellow inmates with a brush and an easel and taught them how to copy his rudimentary, almost childlike, painting style. Then, for a small cut of his money, Gacy's criminal friends could turn out dozens of copies of his creepy portraits like a prison production line. The thing is, while at Medford Prison, while awaiting execution, Gacy's fellow inmates were a number of notorious killers, including Milton Johnson, Andre Crawford, Chester Weger, and Robin Gack. Perhaps one of these notorious criminals created the cursed painting in question, and perhaps they painted more that have yet to be discovered. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash criminallylisted. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.